Welcome to the Speak Like a Leader podcast with John Bates. Welcome to the show. With me today, I have someone that I met of all places in Texas. That's right. And you know, what's really cool is she's got all the best parts of Texas. She's independent. She's happy to stand up for herself. She's willing to make some noise and get heard if she's got something that she's committed to. And she is the known as the impact authority. She's the founder of Grow Disrupt, which is an organization that provides transformational educational experiences for small business owners. And her name is Stephanie Scheller. Stephanie, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, John. I feel like I need to have a Texas accent after that one. I really actually don't. So, <laughs> No, you really don't, do you? I don't. I don't. I spent too much time in Ohio and Alaska and Washington and all over. <laughs> but now you're inspiring the country and indeed the world from San Antonio, right? Yes. San Antonio is my, uh, where I came to after I graduated. It was the big city. Um, so when I, I grew up, dad was military and he ended up retiring out of Del Rio, Texas of all places, which is the place people only know about because it's on the border. Oh. Uh, you know, it's, it's been mentioned in a couple country songs. So, you know, so he ended up retiring there. And so San Antonio was always the big city for us. Yeah. It was very exciting. So when I graduated and I realized I didn't want to stay up North cause I hate cold weather. I do not do well without the sun. Uh -huh. And I wanted to come back to Texas, but I couldn't make money doing what I wanted to do, which was working with horses. So I ended up taking a job in sales, selling advertising to small business owners in San Antonio. And uh, I was excited. San Antonio was uh, growing up in Del Rio. San Antonio was the big city. So yeah. it was a city I loved. And it, we got everything. We got the Riverwalk. We got a phenomenal food scene. We have... Uh, we have you know, nature. This is all true. Yeah, I've been it's there great. And, yeah, and really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, love San Antonio. Well, so you know, yeah. So not that it's a travel show, but I do think that the <laughs> that the River Walk is just amazing. Yeah, and there is just super good food and great places to sit and eat it and hang out and enjoy it. So yeah. Yay, yay, San Antonio. I'll, I'll get, yeah, they've done the river walk very well. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then, so, you know, you started to, uh, to talk about your first job. And I think that you learned an important lesson at that first job, if I'm thinking about the right thing, uh, the right story that I've heard you tell. Do you, you want to tell us that story just to jump yeah. us into this? I, I have to laugh. I learned, I learned a lot of great stories about leadership and mostly what not to do at that job. But yeah. there was, there was That's one important instance. Too. Uh, yeah. yeah, no. But there was one instance that I think was, was and I've, I've shared the story a few times because it's been so pivotal for me. So to give a little background to our listeners here, I started my, uh, I stopped this job selling advertising to small business owners. And when I got the job, I didn't actually realize I was a sales rep. So I actually thought I was a marketing consultant, which was what I wanted to do. And so I get on site the first day and they're walking me through their packages and I'm like, oh, this is great. This is great. Um, and then they hand me like by lunchtime, they hand me the phone book and a phone and they're like, all right, start making calls. And I just like, I was like, what? Uh, and it took me two weeks to realize I was actually a, like, you know, when you don't want to realize something. So yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yes. don't look at, yeah, that was. I'm always the easiest one for me to fool, you know? Yeah. Yes. So two weeks in, I finally realized, oh my God, I'm a sales rep. I don't want to be a sales rep. I don't want sales. That's pushy. It's aggressive. Mm -hmm. And so I was really struggling with being a sales rep. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you are a sales rep, you know how difficult it is. And they had this one rule that if by Thursday afternoon, you were not at quota for the week, you had to be out doing walk-ins to try and generate a sale by the end of the week, which is like the worst thing ever. I'm actually relatively introverted, which no one likes to believe, but I, I am. And so uh -huh. having to go like walk into random places and be 
like, hey, you want to buy from me? Oh, yeah. it like killed my soul. And so there was this one week at, at, that I was out doing walk-ins. And this was relatively shortly after I'd figured out I was a sales rep. And I just didn't want to do these walk-ins. And I remember I get out of the car and it's hot. And I'm looking up at this massive granite building and a bead of sweat trickles down my back and I'm walking into this building and I am 100% like looking there's a bank in the first floor uh-huh. which means there's a security guard sitting in the lobby and I'm walking across the lobby I'm not even here for the bank but I'm freaking out about the fact there's a security guard sitting there and waiting for him to stand up and throw me out because in my mind I am doing something worse than robbing a bank Uh uh-huh I'm here to make a sale and I'm freaking out and I avoid the bank and I go into the the jewelry store and uh, I am trying to be nice about this. And, and what was interesting was that I get in and I say, hey, you know, I'd love to talk with whoever handles your marketing about some ideas we can do for y'all. And, and they're like, oh, well, you know, she's not in right now. Um, and at this point, I'm like already turning back to the door. I'm like, OK, I'm out. Like, you know, and they go, but would you like some water? It's hot. And I just kind of paused and looked at him and. I was like, yeah, that'd be great. And they were like, sparkling or, or still? And I'm like, uh, uh, sparkling, if I have the option. Uh-huh. Uh, so they're getting that, and they're like, would you like a tour? And they're walking me. I mean, it's not a big jewelry store, but they're walking me around. They're showing me this is our custom. This is one of these people. This is why we work with this jeweler. Oh, this is where we do repairs. This is where we do this. And I'm just blown away because they were in that moment. I walked in to pitch them, and they are treating me like I'm the kind of person who's going to buy a diamond bracelet from them. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I was at the time, not the kind of person who would buy a diamond bracelet. Most of my bracelets came from Ross. So (laughs) (laughs) it's like, you know, Um, but they treated me so kindly, even though I, I mean, no, not pushy, not like trying to shove a sail down my throat, but they were so kind. And I just remember being so impressed and walking out, realizing that I didn't have to be a slimy, aggressive, pushy salesperson. I could do sales my way. I could take care of people. And that was the direction I took. And I, the next year I was in that sales position, I was either the number one or the number two sales rep for the entire team every single week. Like it was either me or this other guy. We liked to like kick each other out of the number one spot. Um, but I loved doing it. And what was really cool was, uh, goodness, that would have been 2011 to 2018. So seven years later, I get a call from this lady and she goes, hi, you know, I was told I really need to talk with you that this grow retreat you have coming up is something I really need to attend. I'm really interested. Um, can you get me some more information? And then she says, my name is, and she gives me her name and it's, the name of the jewelry store owner and I froze and I, I couldn't believe it because I realized in that moment that it was her commitment to taking care of her team and her culture that she cultivated. Yeah. That created an environment where I could walk in exhausted, overheated and walk out with my head held high. And it was incredible. It was very, very cool. That is really cool. So did you get to tell her about this? Did you? I did. So the funniest thing, I, I told her over the phone once after we finished talking, I said, I have to tell you, I'm really, really happy to be talking with you. Um, I, you know, as soon as you told me your name, I knew I was going to, the Grow Retreat's invitation only. So you have to get yeah. invited to attend. Yeah. Um, and so I, I didn't, I didn't want to seem like I was brown nosing. So I didn't tell her that before you know, yeah, sure. but after she'd already been like, okay, I'm in, you know, do I have an invitation? I was like, yes, you have an invitation. I said, like, I'm going to be honest. Like I knew you were going to get invited from the moment we started the conversation because, and I told her the story and she was blown away. Of course, her and I'd never met. And, uh, I've told that story three or four times from the stage and on podcasts now as well. Yeah. And, um, it's just, you know, Shetler jewelry here in San Antonio. They are phenomenal people. They will take great care of you. Michelle Shetler's a gem. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad you shared the name. I wasn't sure if you were trying to keep it secret, but I guess why would we keep that secret? No. Well, so you 
usually the way I tell the story, I, I do the whole, like, I walked into a Shetler Way jewelry, you know, and I, I do it. And then I'm like, oh, then she told me Michelle Shetler. And I just, I just messed up the story. So I wasn't oh. trying to keep it a secret. I was trying to, I just messed up. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. But, but it's, so go back to that moment and walking out of there, mm -hmm. that realization, you know, I'm pretty sure I should probably double check this, but I have it on good authority that the word sell sales mm -hmm. actually comes from a Scandinavian root word that means to serve. Oh, that's cool. And I always think about, you know, like, look, when I went in and bought my iMac, I was happy about it. You know, like I, they didn't have to sell me. I was glad that they would sell me my iMac, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think about all the things that I have, bought the experiences, the whatever, the things, the experiences that I've paid money for to somebody who sold it to me. Mm -hmm. That didn't feel like that yucky sales. That was, that was wonderful. Right. And, right. and I think about the people that I work with, you know, like this was something that was taught to me a long time ago and I really took it on, you know, I, I'm, I never want to sell someone to work with me. I want to inspire them about what they're going to accomplish that they want to accomplish out of working with me. And that's just different, right? Yeah. I, so, I so, learned so, so tell me about how that impacted you, that moment of, wow, I don't, it doesn't have to be slimy. Well, I mean, that was a big deal for me because it, up until that moment, I, it, sales had been a bad word. You know, I was, uh, I was raised in the era when the phone would ring at dinner time, and it was always a telemarketer trying to get a hold yeah, of dad. Yep. But but you never knew if it was a telemarketer, so you had to answer just in case it was yep. important, right? Because yeah. you know half the time the voice machine wasn't working or whatever. Yeah. Um. I I, I seem to remember at some period it was even before we had a voicemail. Uh, yeah, like yeah, the, yeah. And um. And so you had to answer, and I just remember my dad getting so angry so many times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, about how you're interrupting my dinner. I work hard all day. I want to spend time with my family. You're just trying to, you know, scam me out of my money. And so to me, sales was a bad word being, I mean, like I, once I realized that's what I was doing, I didn't want to tell my dad for a long time. Like, oh my God, he's going <laughs> to uh -huh. disown me. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, and so to realize that I didn't have to be, I had this one coworker. Okay. Um, I had this one coworker that was like the epitome when I say like used car salesman, uh -huh. mm -hmm. he had the, the, the slicked back black hair that looked like it had been pomaded back, uh -huh. the, the overly white grin with clearly uh -huh. bleached teeth. He was, I don't know, five foot four. I mean, he was just six, I mean, seven. Like he was, he was very short. Um, and he walked everywhere way too quickly mm -hmm. and he talked way too fast and he always uh -huh. had super starched pressed shirts with a tie and man he always got a deal for you, you got a deal for me I mean, one of the things that he told me was stephanie if you are ever at the end of the week and you need a deal look you come get me because i've always got plenty of deals i will slide one across the desk to you and i always hold some back to the end of the week so that just in case i can come in as the superhero at the end of the week and i will slide i will i will give you a deal you needed because i like you i want you to that was how he came into my yeah. office one day yeah yeah i mean like that is just and i just remember talking to one of his clients down the road and she was like, I signed to get him out of my office because he would not <laughs> effing leave. Yeah. And I was like, that was the epitome of what I didn't want to be Yeah, it, that I'm going to strong arm you into buying. And so to realize, I mean, looking at that, that entirely different experience at that point of you can sell and clearly sell well, do well. I mean, these guys are selling expensive jewelry. I mean, this was the type of place I didn't even, there was no price tags on anything. And I certainly wasn't going to ask like mm -hmm. that kind of store. Yeah. Uh, so to realize you could sell and do well and, and probably do better by not yeah. being pushy and aggressive. Yeah. It was a huge shift for me. And it was when I started to tap back into, okay, I took this job because I wanted to help small business owners with their marketing. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And so every time I called my appointment setting script changed from, I want to come talk with you about what we're doing as far as marketing and how we can help you out to, I want to come talk with you about what you're doing for your marketing. I do this all day, every day. I see a ton of marketing ideas. I'm happy to look at what you're doing and see if there are some ideas I can give you. 
And then if one of our programs will work for you, we can get you plugged in. And it completely shifted. I got more appointments that way because more people were like, you know what? If you're going to give me a few ideas and look at, I'll have, I'll let you come look at my marketing. Yeah. And that was what I started doing. And then when it made sense, I was able to fit clients into our programs. And what that turned into was at the end of my first year there, uh, my managers came to me and they said, Steph, um, we want you to take over the retention team. And I was like, ah, I'm fine. Like I'm getting my sales rhythm going. I don't know. And they were like, look, we have a retention of like 8% and it's you. Your clients are the only ones who are making it to the end of their contracts. And I was like, wow. Oh, <laughs> um, probably should have been more concerned that my clients were 8% of their entire revenue yeah. when there were 22 sales reps. But yeah. like, Ta what? <laughs> I just like, Time I just registered there. Um, but so I, I, I switched over to retention. We took them from an 8% retention to 86% retention in three months. Wow. Just by going in and serving and being honest and talking with people through what we were able to provide for them and looking at, okay, here's what you're doing and just doing the same thing, just yeah. serving constantly, consistently. And it was, it was a huge deal at the time. You know, I think that it's it's one of those things that I see in a lot of different places. I see it in sales. I see it in people's willingness to make an emotional connection, especially from the stage or in a high stakes setting. I see it in other places. And, and how I would characterize it is we often get scared away from things because we see other people doing them badly. Right. <laughs> you know, like that's that kind of sales that's manipulation that's not great and i i don't want to do that it doesn't feel good to anybody and people make money that way but they're not truly successful that way i don't think whereas that same position that same job that same function when done authentically from service mm -hmm. becomes something that succeeds much much more and ha has a a totally different feeling about it. And same thing with making an emotional connection in a speech, right? We've all seen somebody up there do that as a manipulation because somebody told them they have to, and they're uncomfortable about it. And it's not even kind of real, or maybe they made this story up. Okay. That's awful. Don't do that. Right. But you know, telling that authentic real story, that's got some deep emotional resonance for the audience that means something that might even bring you to tears to think about that's all fine as long as it's authentic and it's in service, you know? Yeah. And I think that's the key is it really, and, and that can be very challenging for a lot of um, speakers and even business owners is to stay connected to that place of service because you can't do it unless it's kind of the, you can't pour from an empty cup concept. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, you can't serve if you're feeling empty if you are drained and exhausted. So it becomes critical that to recognize it, you know, you, you can't lead, you can't serve when you're drained. And one of the most important things we can do as business owners, leaders is to, is to serve ourselves, to take care of ourselves first and foremost, every step of the way. Yeah. Um, knowing we're doing that in service of others, which now you kind of start to rabbit hole, I guess. Well, you know, it's put on your own mask first, right? I yeah. think that's a pretty great, because if you jump up in the airplane and there's no oxygen, you're helping everybody else. And then you pass out and hit your head. Now you've just become part of the problem, right? And you've made the problem worse because now you've hit your head and you're bleeding and you're yeah. making the aisle. No, okay, yeah, we're not exactly. go down that. <laughs> but yes, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Well, so what are some of the lessons that you have learned out of doing this grow disrupt conference. Now, you know, full disclaimer, disclosure, whatever. I spoke there one year. Uh -huh. It was a total blast. I loved it. You know, I'm a big fan. Um, what are some of the things that you've seen over and over, over the years of doing this, that are some of the lessons that you could share with, with, with our listeners right now? That's a great question. And, um, 
And I am so glad you had a blast. You you spoke in 2019. It has evolved. We are doing some very cool stuff with the well, You evolved through COVID, which was uh, quite a feat, you we, know? <laughs> we did. We, we have not skipped a year. So we started running this event in 2017. We've run it 2017, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. And we'll run it again in 23. Uh, um, and it has, I mean, the formula that, that you spoke at is still there and that we have all the speakers do the keynote day one and then they do a workshop day two. Mm -hmm. And everyone loves that. But it's it's elevated so many times over to give you an example. So we, we've we stopped calling them events. We call them experiences hey, because um, our theme for next year is shift. And so we're looking at what are all the ways we can create shifts it during the event. So for example, I'm creating a custom iced tea blend that is blue. And then when you add lemon to it, it turns pink. Wow. And so it shifts, shifts. literally yeah. shifts like <laughs> ever. I mean, down to the little things, we're going to shift the room around on day two. Yeah. So the actual yeah. tables will move like it. It's, it's, it's an experience. So it's a blast. We'll have to get you to come back one of these days. Um, that said, your question was, was not to go off on my excited, uh, little rant here. <laughs> well, I do. I love the little touches you bring to it. You know, things like you, cause you're always thinking like that. You think yeah. like that in your keynotes that yeah. I've, you know, heard. Um, and you think about that at your conference, which I've experienced. I think that's really cool. I, I like your focus on the little touches, but which that keynote yeah. you helped me put together the opening keynote for last year's grow retreat was uh -huh. phenomenal. People loved it. It was the best opener. I, this feels really like super self-absorbed to say, but I think it was like the best opening keynote we have had at the Grow Retreat, at least on par with Mike and Jesse Cole, um, energy-wise and engagement-wise yeah. from the audience. I mean, it was it was so cool. Um, it was amazing. Well, so, you know, I'll just, I don't think that's super self-absorbed. I think that you know, I, I think you're being pretty, um, you're being pretty objective. You've been to all those things. And what I will say is that you really took the time, you know, your audience, you know, your audience really well. You took the time to craft that speech and real, I mean, that did not happen in a day, you know, right. you, you really, really thought about your audience. You thought about them in the context of that speech. You spoke to them deeply. We, we went through that thing time and time again to make sure that every, the structure of that speech was fabulous. Yeah. Right. And I don't think people usually think enough about the structure of their speeches and how much that structure can just just turbocharge the message, right? Yeah. So you had a great message, you had great stories, and then we structured it, and that thing was just tight. It was fire. It was so good. I appreciate that because that was good. we, we that was really good. we spent a lot of time. I'm now like trying to figure out how to top that. Like, what am I gonna do? Breathe fire or something? Yeah. There uh, you go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Uh yeah. get back to me in a couple of years. But um, that actually does bring up a really good point. Like one of the big things that I learned with the Grow Retreat yeah. is the difference between an amateur and, and an expert. And I say this because in 2018, at the 2018 Grow Retreat, we had like 14 speakers over two days. It was uh -huh. nuts. <laughs> at the 2019 Grow Retreat, the one you joined us at, we had seven then we dropped it to six. Now we're down to five. We have five speakers at a two-day event. Uh -huh. And what I've learned is that, one, I always looked for content that hadn't been told on 100 other stages. Because I, mm -hmm. you know, high-performing entrepreneurs, which is who the event is built for, we've heard a lot of content. We really are tired of hearing the same old, same old, same old content. Yeah, yeah. So I look for good content that hasn't been told a hundred times, but one of the biggest things I learned was that it really comes down to the individuals who have elevated the craft of presenting that content yeah. into something beyond being about the content. And I, I will tell you this a sneak peek into how my brain works when I'm interviewing speakers. 
anytime I get a speaker who is hesitant to let me know what their content is, it tells me that that's all they bring to the table. Like if all they want to give me is their, their overview, that they don't want to tell me what their secret sauce is, what their special process is. It right. tells me that all they have is the content and they're afraid I'll take the content and deliver it better than them. Whereas <laughs> the expert speakers, the experts go, here's my content because you can't match my performance. Yeah. And I know it's true because I've yeah. seen them get on stage and you can always tell at our events who are the expert speakers and then who's like the the person who's really kicking off their speaking career. And they have really good content, but maybe the delivery is not quite there. Yeah. Um, so it, it's that's one of the big things I've learned. And that's not just for speakers, but it's looking at all of your vendors, everyone you work mm -hmm. with. Um, I've had multiple speaking coaches. You've made the most impact with me. And that's because not only are you a good speaker, because that's the thing. You can get speakers who are good speakers who then call themselves speaking coaches, but they don't know the science behind why they do what they do and how it works. And you break it down to here's why you don't want to say this word. Yeah. Here's why that here's the psychological implication it's having in your audience at the moment you say that. And it's like, oh, yeah. my God. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, we did some of that. That was really fun. We did. And it, and it, it makes such a massive difference to real like to be able to back it up. So it's not just, um, it's not just the, the side of, um, of let me get expert speakers, but it's, let me get, you know, let me find someone who's not just a good speaker, but also an expert at speaking coaching, which is what you mm -hmm. did with me. Um, it's let me find someone who's not just doing great marketing for themselves, um, but is also doing great marketing for other individuals if I'm going to hire them to market my business. Yeah. Uh, it's it's finding that person who's truly the expert, who's done it more than once across genres, across industries, and pr produced the same results. And that's the person that you want to learn from. Um, yeah that has elevated their craft to the level where they understand the art of what they're doing, not just the functionality of what yeah. they're doing. Yeah. So that's a big one we've had. I, I could talk all day about what we've learned from the grow retreat, uh, mm -hmm. the, the experience economy and looking at, you know, Hey, we can put on events that are educational or we can put on educational experiences. Um, very good. That's a great distinction. I, that's when we landed on, that was really that, that phrasing was something we picked up literally at the 2022 grow retreat. I was like, we're not calling our stuff. We don't do events anymore. Y'all we create experiences because from the yeah. moment you walk in and you smell the grow retreat aroma and you see that custom blended grow retreat tea and you see the piece of art that we've put up this the entryway piece and you see this this is an experience start to yeah. finish um and it's cool because i don't think enough businesses look at that that um what's the experience well, of your business it's, it's interesting maybe we're maybe we're giving birth to a collaboration right now but one of the things that I have been thinking about a lot is the, the, so we're talking now in March of 2022 yeah. and most businesses, a huge amount of, of white collar businesses, especially have been just working from home. And now they've got a lot of new people that have never met everybody. They've got a lot of people that know each other but haven't seen each other for forever. And they've, the whole world seems to have shifted under our feet. And there are still a lot of people that right or wrong, good or bad. It just, it's kind of weird and nerve wracking to get together with other people after two years of not, you know? Yeah. So I have this feeling that maybe my bold predictions here are, we're never going to go back to working in the office all the time, like we used to. Some places will push for that, but I don't even think the places that push as hard as they can will will actually get there. So there's going to be this virtual element, working from home piece that's going to be bigger than it was. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot more places are going to go to something that's pretty hybrid, and even even some places are going to go remote first. Yeah. But we're still going to need and want to get together. And so I've been thinking about the work that I do and how I can bring that emotional connection piece and the communication piece 
and do something that would be, like you said, an educational thing, but also create an experience, create a safe container, give people some suggested ways to go out and feel safe connecting and give people, you know, so that we could do like a two or three day event that would get some training in, but also restore and replenish and renew those bonds mm -hmm. that people need to really work together. You know? So I think that this educational experience type thing is, you know, that's probably for me, I'm thinking that is going to quickly become one of the core pillars of what I offer to organizations. And I think it's not any different for entrepreneurs. You know, it's why the grow disrupt retreat is so awesome because so many entrepreneurs are used to working at home alone and doing most of it themselves and all that to just be around other people that get them. Yeah. It means everything. And they, they, you know, we, we talk all the time. I get speakers who ask me, you know, what do you want your attendees to get out of this? And one of the biggest things that I always reiterate is like, if you watch how people walk into the room on day one, yeah. they walk in with their heads down, their shoulders slumped, they're checking their phone, they're breathing shallow, they're frustrated, they're <laughs> dealing with something already, and it's 940 and it's nine o'clock in the morning, right? It's 840. Yeah. Yeah. And what I want them to get out of this is I want them to remember how freaking incredible they are. The yeah. impact they're having on the world to reconnect with their vision and their passion. That's what I want them to get out of this. And that's fabulous. That, first of all, it always, I get the speakers are always like, oh, wow. Um, but yeah. like, that's what I think we are missing is that reconnection. Yes, with others, but also with our, like, I think yeah. we're losing ourselves in a lot of ways. You know, and you've come back to that theme a couple of times. Let's go down that because I think you're totally right. And I just want to say before we do that, I think that anybody that's running a team at a big organization mm -hmm. could think about what you just said as what they want their employees to get out of being at work, you know? Mm -hmm. It, that would not be a bad context. You know? Or or if you do a team retreat, yeah, you notice they're going to walk in the same way or stressed out or freaked out about what if I say the wrong thing in front of my boss? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so make it a, my goal is to help them remember because what, something really incredible happens when your people reconnect with themselves, with mm. the powerhouse that they are, yeah. Productivity goes up, engagement goes up, ha works force happiness goes up, yeah. creativity goes up. Yeah. All of these have direct impacts on the bottom line. It's it's well worth it to consider how you can get your people to pick up their heads and reconnect with themselves. So so without giving us all of your secret sauces. <laughs> Uh, what is, you know, what is something that say I'm an, I'm listening to this and I'm an entrepreneur and I've got a small team, or let's say that I work at a big organization and maybe I have a, you know, a big team. Mm -hmm. What, what would be one way that tomorrow I could walk in and, and try to help people get who they are again and reconnect with themselves? Is there something you can think of that, that would be that quick and, and available? So the biggest question, the, the, the biggest thing I would encourage uh, someone, an organization, a manager, a leader, a business owner to reconnect with is uh, if you want your team to really reconnect with how incredible they are, you better do it first. Perfect. Perfect. Physician, heal thyself. <laughs> it's, I mean, well, it's it's two sides. It's yes, connect with yourself and and what you what you're. But I want you to take a minute, write down the names of your team members, and ask yourself what is so freaking awesome about them. Oh, even better. And right? then, so first yourself, and then all of your team members. Right, because if I I do a generic, hey y'all, you're fantastic. I love working with you guys. You're great. It's not nah. going to go over the same way, especially you have a, a team, even a five people, a small team, yeah. they are all going to receive that differently. Someone in the room is going to get jazzed up by that. And someone else is going to be like, yeah, lip service, shut up. 
Like yeah. they're not going to say that to you, but they're just, they're just going to shrug it off. So sit there and, and yes, first and foremost, make sure you're connected because you can't, I, you know, I, I recently went through a period where we had, we just had so much going on post grow retreat. Then we've been filming. We actually, um, produced and filmed a, a, a fictional web series, like a, a funny fictional, it's, it's been a lot of work. And I reached a <laughs> point where at the end of the grow retreat wrap up filming the doing business as web series, um, the venue planning for the grow retreat 2023, the speaker interviews for grow retreat 2023, the whole nine yards. I was exhausted. And on top of that, I was supposed to be planning a team retreat for my team. And I had no bandwidth and I was just completely just shut down and I had to take, I had to sit back and, and I did exactly that where I said, okay, I'm going to take some time to take care of me because yep. right now I don't want it. I don't care about what my team gets out of this retreat. I just want it over with. I was <laughs> like, that is not the right perspective to go in here with. Yeah. And then once I'd done that, then I sat down and I said, okay, so what do I know about my team members, the individual team members? What are they dealing with? What do they love? What motivates them and inspires them and, and gets them excited? And then I put together packets for each of the little welcome gift packets for each of them that had stuff that they loved. And so they, you know, chocolate and special teas and just all these little things that tap into who they are and what they talk about all the time and the things they really enjoy. And so when they showed up on site, they felt seen and it reminded them of all the best parts of themselves. Yeah, that's fabulous. And that's what I would recommend is if you will take a minute just to ask yourself, what could I bring in that would really mean something to this person? I guarantee you know it. You may yeah. just need a minute to pull it out of your head. Yeah. You know, I think that there's that for so long we've been living in this world of like mass emails and social media, one to many, 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 and just all, all these things. And look, I'm projecting, okay, I'll own this. There's this part of me that I think got kind of accustomed to this do it once, have it serve many people. Sure. Okay, that's nice and everything. But I have to admit, very recently, I've been getting back in touch with the value of not mass. Yeah. You know, just really sitting down and taking the time to this person who just sent me an email to really be with that for a minute and think about them and think about my answer or this person who just wanted to connect with me on LinkedIn to, to take a couple seconds and actually figure out who in the world they are and what's going on with them so that when I talk to them, it can be a valuable conversation no matter what. Right. And I think that what you're saying is, is that again, this take a minute and think about each individual on your team and give them a couple minutes to just to, you know, come up with, like you said, something that's great about them. And then, and then let them know, you know, that, I mean, the, how far that goes in a world where we're all getting by on mass messages from social media and stuff. Right. Even if you just, even if you just go to the people who immediately respond to you and all you do is you write a letter, a handwritten letter that's specific to them. By the way, I saw how you handled this and it really meant a lot to me because of X, Y, Z. Yeah. It creates a waterfall effect when they mm -hmm. then go to the person who responds to them yeah. and they then go to the person who responds to them. And so it, it can cascade. And I will say there's a time and a place for the automated mass messaging. I mean, that's, it's not sure, that we have to do away yeah. with it, but no. at the same time, if you want someone to feel special, sending out a general mass, it's not going <laughs> to make it, it's not going to work. Not for that. No. So take a minute and, and customize it and really think about what will make them feel special and then, and then do it. So Stephanie, I'm just conscious of the time and, yeah. and I, I haven't said it yet. This will be in the show notes, but people can find you at the Stephanie Scheller.com. That's T H E S T E P H A N I E S C H E L L E R. Dot com and on Facebook at facebook.com success Steph and Steph is with a pH. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, before we have to go, 
is there is there anything that I didn't bring up that that's on your mind that you'd love to say to this audience of of leaders and people who are interested in communication and things like that? You know, I think what I would encourage any of these leaders to do is to remember. So I, we, we kind of, I don't think we actually did mention, um, but I, I, br- I play the violin. I bring it on stage yep. for my speaking engagements. And so I y- use it in various ways. But one of the things I remind people of all the time is that when I started playing the violin, it was, you know, it wasn't anything really fancy. It was, you know, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wondered. And that still yeah. sounded like a cat was dying in the alleyway. I mean, it was rough. <laughs> yeah. And what I remind people is when we think of, when we think of the violin, when we think of music, we think of something incredible and poignant and powerful and, and majestic. But all of those people started with, Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wondered where you are. Yeah. And sounded screechy. And it sounded screechy and it didn't, it was not exciting. And what I would encourage any one of these leaders to remember is twofold. One, it's awkward when you first start learning to play the violin. And it's awkward when you first start implementing these leadership skills. And it sounds screechy and it comes out a little bit wrong and you get a little bit of egg on your face because you stood up on stage and you missed the note. Mm -hmm. But if you, one, will recognize that everyone started there. Yeah. And two, recognize that they got to where they are by consistently practicing. And whenever we think about practice, we think that practice is uh, is them coming and playing this really incredible um, piece, you know? And we think it, it's the actual playing, but what practice usually sounds like is, is this. Or transitioning positions on the violin, which I'm not going to do because it really sounds terrible, but it, you, <laughs> where you play one note and then you slide into another note and it has this like squeaky, <laughs> except you're actually supposed to do it. Uh-huh. And so you're listening and you're just playing the violin going, I just want it to sound good. I just want it to sound good. And if you don't practice, first of all, that scale sounds a lot better than the scales sounded like when I first started playing scales. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> Secondly, yeah. if you don't do the practice, you'll never get to the point where you can play the performance piece. So don't be afraid to put in the time yeah. to practice and practice for the art of practicing, not for the art of performing. Get clear on what you're doing for why you're doing it in the moment, not so that you can be a better leader down the road, but so that you can do better at this individual task, playing this note better. And it will make a world of difference down the road. That's fabulous. Well, Stephanie, thank you very, very much for joining us today. Again, people can find you at the Stephanie Scheller. Uh, It'll be in the show notes and on Facebook at success Steph. And thank you very much for everything that you've done for me. And thank you for everything that you do for entrepreneurs. Thanks for putting on Grow Disrupt and just keeping on, keeping on. I think you bring great things into the world. I know I've been there. I've seen it. And so, you know, that's what we need. That's what we need. Just more people that are contributing like you. So thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. That means a lot. Thank you for joining the Speak Like a Leader podcast. Go be awesome.